When I first got saved at the age of 17, better than five years ago, and I go to church and then I got baptized and they gave me a Bible as a gift, I was so excited to learn the Bible because I had been you know, attracted to God's word from the time I was in the fifth grade where a Gideon gave me a, a Bible outside of Riverside Elementary School. And so, loved the word, got to church, pastor opened up the Bible, read the text, and then when he got through reading the text, he said, close your Bibles, and then he introduced the topic. And that happened week after week, and I remember thinking, why are we closing our Bibles? I want to learn this thing. At Word of God Ministries, never close your Bible, amen? Keep your Bibles open. Genesis 26, I want to show you something here. Let's key in on verse number 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land. Then Isaac sowed in that land. I want to emphasize the word that because it's separating this particular land. So if you would, let's read that first part out loud, but when you get to the word that, I want you to emphasize that, okay? Ready? Read. Then Isaac sowed in that land. So what's significant about that land? Because the land that he sowed in, the Bible says in verse 12, that he received in the same year, what? A hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. So he got the optimum return. When you hear a hundredfold in the Bible, when you read the hundredfold, Jesus speaks of sowing a seed in Mark 4, Matthew 13, and in both cases where he talks about the word being sown, he, he talks about the return, the 30-fold, the 60-fold, the hundredfold. When you hear hundredfold, don't just think, well, I got to multiply what I sowed by a hundred. You know, the Bible says that he that has friends must first show himself friendly. And I want you to think about seed today and not limit sowing to finances. Because many times in church when we hear about sowing and the preacher's talking about sowing, our mind goes to money. Oh, here's another message of a preacher because all preachers want is your money. That's what folks say. Well, listen, I don't like making things about money because here's the thing. Jesus said that where your heart is there your treasure will be. When people give their heart to the Lord, they're gonna give their treasure. They're gonna give their time. They're gonna give their service. Whatever my life possesses, I'm gonna give to God once he has my heart. So I am, I am concerned about your heart being given to God because if we give our heart to God, he's got everything else so we don't have to talk about money and this and that. Why? Because our heart has been given to the Lord and that's my motive when I minister but I don't want you limiting this sowing to finances because you're gonna miss the bigger point in what I wanna cover today because what I wanna talk about today is sowing in a drought. Sowing in a drought. Sowing in a dry place. So let's look at this example here in Genesis 26, 12, because Isaac sows in that land and received the same year a hundredfold, optimum return. Let me say it to you this way, and I know it's hard to do with these masks. That's one thing I'm just hating about these masks when I'm out in public is because, you know, I, have, I was out yesterday and went to Home Depot and had a few people to see me, and I, I had a ball cap on and my mask, so they were a little like, is that him? And so they came past and I was like, yes, me. And, and uh, you know, I'm smiling at people that I see, but they can't see me smile. I'm like, I'm smiling. You just don't know I'm smiling. And so I find myself smiling so big, I'm worried about getting a bunch of wrinkles around my eyes because, I mean, I'm having to overexpress myself so people can see that I'm smiling. Can you see my face? Real? I'm smiling beneath this mask. So we got to get some masks that have the word smile written on them or something. But if you're sowing a smile, let's say a smile is a seed, do you then reap 100 people smiling back at you? The point of the hundredfold is I'm sowing a seed emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, I'm sowing a seed, and God is blessing that seed with the optimum return, the best possible return. That's the point, and that's what Isaac got. Now, what was it about that land that when he sowed into it, it yielded a hundredfold? Well, let's go back to verse one to find the answer, verse one. And there was a famine in the land. Read that out loud. And there was a famine in the land. So what's significant about that land is that it was dry. There was a famine in that land. 
Now, I want you to think about that in our own lives, especially in a year like 2020, where it's been a difficult year. And, and you think about how dry the climate is and how dry people have become. You know, the pre-service video that comes on about four minutes before church starts, for those of you that get here early, was filmed at the beginning of the year. It was filmed months ago. And when I hear it, I think, man, that was only the Holy Spirit because so much has happened since that was actually filmed. With, with, with the coronavirus and just the unrest and the division and the hate and everything that seems to be going on in America today and across the world, not just in America, but everywhere. I mean, it's happening in far places where there is such division and hate. And so here we are in a dry place. I look at the world and say, man, this is a dry place. And if we're not careful, it affects us. It affects our marriages. It affects our homes. It affects our children. It affects how we communicate and how we relate to one another. So how we sow in a dry land is vital. And so Isaac here is sowing in this land of famine. And the Bible says that the same year, the Lord gave him the hundredfold the same year. Glory to God. I want you to put a bookmark here in Genesis 26 because we got to come back. But I want to go over to Psalms 126. Turn over to Psalms 126. And let me say this about Isaac sowing and in the same year reaped a hundredfold. I've heard a lot of folk talk about how they, be a, they will be glad when this year is over. And, and, you know, we really shouldn't think that way because God's doing something in this year. It's not the year we may have thought it would be, but it doesn't mean God can't use it and do something in it and through it because he specializes in doing something good in the midst of something bad, turning all things for good to them that love him. So I was gone for two weeks. I get back in town, hop in my vehicle Thursday, get ready to run some errands, and my, my phone, you know, connects to my vehicle, and my playlist had gotten all off, I guess because I hadn't used it in two weeks. You know, your Bluetooth and all that. And my Apple Music started playing Christmas music. It's July. I just got back home, and Christmas music is coming through my radio. And so the first thought was, is well, as soon as I get stopped, I got to turn this Christmas music off and get back to my playlist. And I thought, no, I am not doing that. I'm going to savor this moment. I'm looking forward to Christmas, so I'm going to let the Christmas music play because it will give me hope that hopefully by Christmas time, we got these masks ripped off our face, that, 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 that this thing has been resolved, and that there's some kind of wholeness that's come across the land. So I'm hoping for big things by Christmas. And I'm not a big partier, and I go to bed early, and most of my life, I watch that ball fall on New Year's Eve, and I, when it fell, I went to bed, didn't even realize it was actually falling at 11 o'clock my time because it's midnight in New York and it's 11 here. Didn't matter to me. Baby, not this year. I'm going to party like it's 1999. I'm telling you, I am going to celebrate the coming of 2021. And if I had the ability of, of Prince, I would rewrite that song and say, I'm going to party like it's 2021. Isaac sold and the same year the same year he walked in the hundredfold return. We have to know that Genesis 8.22 says that as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. We have to recognize that no matter what's going on in this world, no matter what's going on in the, in the social climate, the political climate, the economical climate, it doesn't matter what's going on in Shreveport, the mayor's office, the White House, or somewhere in between. It doesn't matter what's going on at the church or, or what's happening on the streets. God is faithful to his word. And as long as this earth remains, he's going to honor the sowing of seed. He He's going to honor his word. And so just because everything around us has changed does not mean that his word or his promise has changed. Hallelujah. And I say that because I feel like the reason God blessed Isaac with the hundredfold when he sowed in that land is that famine will tell you not to sow. A dry place will tell you to harbor and to only think about yourself and, and to be survival minded. It's true in life. It's true in a relationship. 
if I'm speaking to you today and you're married and your marriage is dry and he has a tone and she has a tone and Victoria has become a secret and things ain't what they once were, you know good and well when everybody's abrasive, all of a sudden now you don't want to be kind, you don't want to be affectionate, you don't want to be loving. You, you, why? Because the, the, the marriage is dry. But we have to recognize that when the home is dry, when the marriage is dry, when the bank account is dry, when life is dry, when my spirit seems dry, it is more important that I sow then than any other time in my life. That's why I wanted you to see Psalm 126. So watch this in Psalms 126. When it's hard to sow, that's when it's most needful. Jesus said, if you love somebody that loves you, what thank have ye? But if you love someone that hates you and would despitefully use you, then, 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 then you bring glory to your Father in heaven. Church, we have to recognize that, you know what, when I step out into this world, man doesn't make me who I am. He makes me who I am. No person makes me who I am. And because you didn't make me who I am, you can't change who he made me to be. And so you might be in the worst mood ever. You might be hateful. You might be prejudiced. You might look at me cross-eyed, but I can still look at you with the love of God. I can still put a face of a smile behind this mask. I can still treat you with dignity and respect, recognizing that you were made in the image of God no matter what you think of me. Why? Because you don't make me who I am. He makes me who I am. My my identity is found in him, and this world needs people that know who they are, know who their father is, and walk in a love and sow a seed even when it's not welcomed. It was Dr. King that said, hate does not drive out hate. Only love can do that, and it is time the body of Christ rise up in this dry climate and say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sow truth, and I'm going to sow love, and I'm going to sow grace, and I'm going to sow righteousness. It may be rejected. It may be resisted. It, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I will not let the climate of this world condition my mind and how God has called me to live. I am going to be who he called me to be. And that seed that you sow when it is resisted and when it is hard will bring the greatest harvest. That's what I want you to see in this word today. It's hard. My daddy used to say, son, if it's easy, everybody do it. Watch this in Psalms 126. There's six verses here. Amen. I, man, I'm going to take eight minutes where I can get it. Thank you, Lord. A, and a child shall lead them. Watch this. Psalm 126, there's six verses. When you study this psalm, it's not written in chronological order. What I mean is, is what you see in verse 1 is not what happened first. If you were to read Psalm 126 in the order of events, you would have to start in verse 4. Read verse 4, 5, and 6, and then read verse 1, 2, 3. All right, let's look at verses 1, 2, 3 first. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, Zion in Scripture represents the kingdom of God, the people of God, the place of God. It can represent heaven. It can represent Israel. It can represent Jerusalem. It can represent the church. In the New Testament, it represents for you and I the church. So we are Zion. There's probably more churches named after Zion than any other name. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, now there are a lot of first churches too, never driven by a second Baptist church. But when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that what? Dream. It was so good, it was like a dream. It was like a dream, a good dream, because I had a crazy dream last night. I dreamed about a witch last night. I don't like witches. I dreamed about a witch, a witch, when I finally got to sleep, got up in my dream. And the witch was after a friend of mine and was after me, and I got, pre I got knowledge that the witch was after me, and I'm like, man, I woke up, I said, what in the world am I dreaming about a witch? And then it hit me. Then on the way home, we drove through Kansas. Stayed away from the airport, drove through Kansas, stopped by this little, in this little town, and man, it was, ate at this nice restaurant, and the whole downtown of this little town in Kansas was, was uh, 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 paved in bricks. Yeah, but, but it wasn't, they weren't yellow. 
And, and when the kids got talking about The Wizard of Oz, and I hate the movie The Wizard of Oz. This movie scares me like you wouldn't believe. I was a little child watching The Wizard of Oz, and when they threw that water on that witch, and she said, I love I ran out the house, out the yard, out the fence, and down the street, and I never saw the rest of that movie. That water on that witch scared the life out of me. I never want to watch that. That green woman, that big head. Oh, God, I'm thinking about it. Now I got to forget I bind it in the name of Jesus. That witch got in my dream last night. I knew it was going to be a powerful day when the enemy tried to get in my head even last night. Now, I don't know what made me think about that witch. But anyway, oh, like them the dream, like them the dream. Good dreams, not nightmares. He said, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with what, church? Laughter and our tongue with singing and the masks were removed. Then said they among the heathen or unbelievers, the Lord hath done great things for them. Isn't it awesome when God does something so big in your life that even the unbeliever has to acknowledge that God has done something in your life? And that's what he's saying here, that even the heathen, the unbeliever is going to acknowledge God. And our response will be in verse 3, the Lord hath done great things for us whereof we are glad. That's why you hear the laughter. That's why you see the singing. We're glad about what God has done. Now, that is not what happened first. Because when you look at verse 4, notice the uh, first statement there. Turn again our captivity. So in verse 4, they're still in bondage. But verse 1 says, when the Lord turned again, the what? Captivity. So what the point I'm trying to make here is, is that verses five, 4, 5, and 6 are telling us what they did in order to make verses 1, 2, and 3 happen. See, it's one thing to look at somebody's life or somebody's marriage, and you say, man, that's the marriage I want. That's the family I want. When I think about Brother Jefferson and his wife, Denitra, and their children and their home, just a model family. This brother was up serving at the academy this week, just a blessing to our staff, a blessing to our kids. If you know the Jefferson family, you love the Jefferson family. What family do you know creates their own crest? They have their own family crest that demonstrates their faith. I mean, this is a model family. Now, you might look at that family and you say, you know what? That's the kind of husband I want. That's the kind of wife I want. That's the kind of you know, family I want for my kids. But you're looking at something not knowing what led to it. What led to it? What made this home this way? What made this marriage this way? What made this family this way? Because there's always a backstory to what we look at in honor. And so when you read verses 1, 2, and 3, and you say, oh, yes, Lord, turn my captivity, make my life like I'm dreaming, what led to that? What brought about that type of abundance? Verse 4, turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Now watch verse 5. They that sow in, what? Tears shall reap in joy. So I'm sowing and I'm crying. I'm sowing and I'm hurting. I'm sowing and it's hard. This is hard to do. This seed is hard. I'm sowing in tears. Watch this. I'm reaping in joy. Watch verse six. He that goeth forth and weepeth, Bearing what kind of seed, church? Precious seed. That seed that's at the bottom of the barrel. That seed that that widow woman sold into the ministry of Elijah in 1 Kings 17 when she said, this is the last bit of meal I have, but I'm going to make it for you. And the Bible says when she made it for Elijah, that that barrel of meal never wasted. It was precious seed. It was hard to give seed. Seed is most precious when it's hardest to give. David said in uh, 2 Samuel 24, 24, because a man was going to give him something so that he could give to God. 
But David said back to the man that was going to give him something so that he could give to God. David said, no, I'm not going to let you give me something that I give God. I will buy it from you and then give it to God, but I won't let you give it to me and then I give it to God. And he said these words, for I will not give to God that which costs me nothing. It's not a sacrifice until it's costly. It's not a sacrifice until you had to pay the price and give it. That's why loving folk that are filled with hate is so precious to God. That's why being kind to those that have been ugly to you is so precious to God. That's why giving out of your lack is so precious to God. Sowing in tears will always set you up to reap in joy. Isaac sowed in famine and in the same year reaped the hundredfold. He didn't let the, 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 the famine change his sowing. He didn't let the famine change his conviction. Hallelujah. Now watch this. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed. You know, this, this ministry went three months with, with no assembly. And you might look at that naturally and say it's three months that there was no offering unless you gave online or mailed something in. And we went post-COVID, we went from between five and 6,000 people here on a Sunday, including our children's ministry, to now between five and 600 a Sunday. Even though the numbers are picking up, COVID changed everything for the last, since March of this ministry. I'm sure all the ministries that we support, and we support just about every ministry in the area and, and, and abroad, I'm sure they would have all understood if we'd have called them up and said, hey, you know what? Things are hard. Dad had church in three months. Giving is down. We're going to have to pull back. But as soon as things turn around, we'll pick our support back up. You need to know this as a member. Not one ministry, not one partner that we support has not received their support on the first of the month. None of our giving has gone down. We've stayed faithful to what we have committed to do, and God is faithful. We were strong coming into COVID. We're going to be strong during COVID, and we're going to be strong post-COVID. I'm not worried about it. It may be harder to do, but that's when God will bless it, and I have no doubt that he's blessing his seed. Even while I was away, I got a text all the way from Jerusalem. Matter of fact, I was talking about Jerusalem and Israel at the time, and I get a text on my phone from one of our ministry partners in Jerusalem texting me saying, hey, pastor, thank you for your support. We love you. We're praying for you daily. And I know that people are probably taking a hit from ministries that can't give, but we will not stop giving. We will not stop sowing. Why? They that sow in tears when it is hard will reap in joy. And I am believing God that we are going to see the optimum return in our lives, in your life, in this ministry, in a way that will bring him glory. If you agree, say amen. Hallelujah. The most precious seed is sown when it is hard. Now, let's go back to Genesis 26. Because there's some unlovable people in the world. And your mind will tell you, they ain't worthy of your love. They're not worthy of your kindness. But God will bless it. It's what the world needs right now. Now, watch this in Genesis 26. So here's Isaac sowing in this land of famine. Same year, same year, 2020, glory to God. Walked into hundredfold. Verse 13 says, The man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great, for he had possessions of flocks and herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. But watch the problem in verse 15. For all the wells, all the wells, which his father's servants had digged, in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth, with dirt. What kind of enemy would come up on your land and fill your well with dirt? But that's what the Philistines had done to the wells Abraham had dug. So here's Isaac, Abraham's son, and he's drank from those wells all his life. To think of it this way, even when there's no water on the surface, even when there's no water on the surface, I can go to the well that's penetrated deep in the earth and pull water, even when there isn't any falling from the sky or any on the surface. Those wells had always provided, but now they're not providing. The wells are filled with dirt. But it didn't stop Isaac from sowing. 
Now let's bring this into a place of application. Think about your life. Think about your marriage. Think about your relationship with the Lord. Think about the times in your life when you've been in prayer or you've been in worship, whether a worship service or just having a, a private worship encounter with the Lord in your room. And think about the times when you just felt the tangible touch of God and you knew that he was present. You knew that he was near. You knew that he was hearing you. I have had moments like that throughout my life. I remember one day preaching in Houston and driving up uh, 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 Highway 259 in Texas. And I'm listening to, to a worship song. And I'm crying and I'm praising Jesus driving down the road in that big four-lane highway in the hills, in the, in the, tr- in, in the woods. And, and, and I, I remember praying, Lord, whatever my cross is, I'll bear it. Because I was getting tired of driving to Houston every week and preaching down there and driving back to Shreveport and then driving to Dallas on Friday, which I did for five years. And I'm like, Lord, this is, this is my cross. And I'm crying. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual moment. And I'm, I'm like, Lord, if this is my cross, I'll bear it. In that very moment, I looked on the side of the highway, and there was a man with a big old massive cross over his shoulder, so big that he had wheels on the base of the cross with one of them orange uh, uh, traffic uh, cones on there. And he's dragging the cross down the road. And, I'm, and at that very moment, I just said, Lord, if this is my cross, I'm like, I know I ain't seeing what I think I'm seeing. I was so moved, I made a U-turn to go look at it again to make sure I wasn't caught up in some kind of vision. Later, I got home, watched the news, and found out this man was toting that cross all the way across the country, and I happened to pass him. An intimate moment when you know God is there, and you know he's present. Church, we live for those moments, but you've got to be real. There are some times in your spiritual walk when you feel like something has filled your well, that your well is dry, that it's somebody put dirt in it, and God, where are you, and do you love me anymore, and I don't sense your presence like I used to, and praise doesn't do what it used to to do for me. And Lord, is there something wrong with me? Have I, have I lost something, God? Have you left me? Our wells are not always filled. And Isaac is facing dry wells. Wells that his daddy dug. Wells that he drank from that he never dug. Church, you know what dry places will do? It'll make you dig your own well. Times can get so hard, you can't live off your mama's spirituality. You can't live off your daddy's faith. You can't live off grandma's faith. You know, you know that you could always go, you know, to big mama's house, and she had a word, and she had a prayer, and she had that, that, that worn out Bible, and she would lift it up and quote scripture to you. But big mama gone to heaven now, and now you got to dig your own well. You got to know when it's dry, that you can reach deep, and that God is still faithful to that. There comes a time when the dry place will force us to dig a new well. David recognized that in Psalm 51, when he, after he had committed that sin with Bathsheba and felt separate and disconnected from God, he went to God in Psalms 51, and sin will always dry your well. It'll make you feel like that well is filled with dirt. But David went before God, and he said, Lord, Restore unto me thy free spirit and restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And we need that sometimes. God, I need a fresh filling. I need a move. I need you to do something in me. Dig that well back up again, Lord. I filled it with sin. I filled it with selfishness. I filled it with other things of this world. But I need you, Lord, to do something new. Isaac sowed where there are no wells. He sowed when there was no water. Watch what God does. Verse 24. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night. Don't you love it when God moves quick? And the Lord appeared unto him the same night. I think about Acts 16 when Paul and Silas were in prison at midnight, and they're going to be killed the next morning. The Bible says they sang and praised and praise God. And the Bible says there was an and suddenly, and suddenly God sent an earthquake and got him out. I need an and suddenly. I need an and suddenly. Glory to God. Look how quick God responded to this seed. And he appeared to, the, to uh, Isaac in the same night. And he said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee. And multiply thy seed for thy servant Abraham's sake. 
I love what God is saying here because sometimes we think God's moves are generational and that it's already passed. God was saying, listen, the same wells I provided Abraham, I'll provide you. I'm not a one-generation God. I'm a multi-generation God. I'm not just the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I see a thing all the way through. I'll bless you not only to see your children blessed. I'll, I'll bless you till you see your children's children blessed. That's what kind of God I am. Hallelujah. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a multi-generation God. And just because he moved great in your family's life... Or in your, in, in, your, in your history or in your family history. Doesn't mean he won't move great in your life. And that's what he's saying to Isaac right here. He said, you, 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 don't you worry about the wells that your father dug that are now filled. I'll bring new wells out of you. Glory to God. So let's see what happens. Verse 32. And it came to pass the same day, the same day, that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged and said unto him, read it out loud, we have found water. Come on, read it through that mask out loud. We have found water. He said, hey, hey, hey Isaac, we got water. We got water. What good would it be? For God to multiply a, uh, uh, Isaac's uh, 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 cattle if he had no water to give them. Well, what good would it be for him to bless him with a land that was filled with drought? So God gave him, help me, the optimum return, the best possible return. He gave him water. He said, we have found water. We have found water. Isaac sowed, and they found water. And we got to sow until we find water. I know so I'm talking to somebody right now. You've been married a few years, and it ain't what it used to be. And right now the marriage is dry, and everybody's got a tone, and she's snapping at you, and you snapping at her, and y'all may have been laid off through corona, and you got tired of looking at each other, stuck up in that house, everything closed down, and you just, everybody's taking it out on everybody. Right now this world is in a hurting place. I heard the other day that antidepressant drugs are actually in a shortage right now because of the number of prescriptions that are being written. Domestic abuse is up. Spousal abuse is up. Everything is up. Why? Because people are in such a dry world. We're taking it out on each other. And that may be describing your home right now. It might be describing your marriage right now where it is dry and abrasive. But the word of the Lord to you today is, is you got to sow in the midst of this. You got to sow. And I'm telling you, you keep sowing until you find water, until the same marriage that was once in a garden returns. You can't let the climate of your marriage stop you from sowing the right seed. Three of y'all, amen, glory. Now come with me, lastly, to 1 Kings 18. So they came to Isaac and they said, we found water. That was no coincidence. He sold for that. He sold for that. He sold in drought and reaped water. Now watch this in 1 Kings, and I'm going to close here in the 18th chapter. Let me show you another example of this. Same, same biblical principle. Now for time's sake, I want to tell you what's going on. There's been a three and a half year drought this is Elijah, and the children of God have turned, for the most part, to worship Baal. They're, wor they're worshiping an idol, a false god, and Elijah is the prophet of God. As a matter of fact, it's Elijah that called on the drought. He said, the rain will not fall until you people turn. And so the brass, the heavens became as brass, and there was a judgment, and there was no rain because of the idolatry of God's people. Well, Elijah has had enough. And he said, let's have a showdown. You prophets of Baal, come on, and I'll come on, and we'll build an altar, and you call on the name of Baal, and I'll call on the name of the Lord, and whichever God answers by fire, let it be known in the land he is God. And everybody said, okay, let's do it. So they get out there, and the prophets of Baal call on the Lord, I mean, the, the Baal, and there was no answer. Elijah's over there poking fun at him, saying, hey, maybe he's on a journey, maybe he's asleep. It must be awakened, verse 27. They started cutting themselves and jumping up and down on the altar like it was a trampoline and, and no answer. So now it's Elijah's turn. So he repairs the altar in verse 30. 
In verse 31, he, he takes 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel. Now watch verse 32, very important. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench. He made a trench about or around the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. So as he's digging the trench around the altar, his mindset is, I'm going to put seed in this. I'm getting ready to sow. But watch what he puts in the trench. In the middle of verse 33, the Bible says, he said, fill four barrels with water. Pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. He said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. That's 12 stones and now 12 barrels of water. It's not rained in three and a half years. The most precious thing they have is water. And it looks like he's wasting it by dumping it on this altar, but he's not wasting it. That's why he dug the trench, because he wants that water to stay at the altar. If he doesn't dig the trench and he dumps the water, water just runs out everywhere. But he dug a ditch because he doesn't want to waste his seed. He's intentional about where he's sowing. Oh, my gosh, that's good. Hallelujah. He don't want his sacrifice just one all over the place. He wants it to stay at the altar. So he digs a trench so that the sacrifice will be at the altar because it's the altar that, that God's going to respond to. It's the altar that God's going to answer by fire. So he needs his sacrifice to be at that altar. Just like he took stone and wood to give a platform for the bullock that he put. He needed a platform for the water. He needed a place to put the water in so that God could receive his offering. Listen, the, the way we present our offering is vital. Hallelujah. So he digs this trench because he knows what he's getting ready to give. And the most precious thing he could give would not be that bullock. That's another mouth to have to feed and give water to. The most precious thing is water because it gives life. So he dumps 12 barrels of water in that trench. Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of, of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. I was getting ready to come up here this morning, and, and this thought came across me. I said, you know, some people are going to come today. They're going to come to hear the word. They're going to gather. People are going to mock them, say, what are you doing going up there? You, you shouldn't be in church. You're supposed to social distance, and we're doing everything we can to do all of that. And it's amazing how critical the world has gotten of the church. You can do about anything else, and it's all accepted, but oh, God forbid you worship. That, that's the world I'm talking about. And I was thinking about the thousands, because I think right now just on live.wgm on Sundays, we got like 6,000 devices that are tuned into these cameras. And I was thinking about the people that are tuned in the Word, and that it's not in vain that there's nothing more important in my life and there's nothing import, more important in our lives than living by God's word, knowing what God's word has taught me to do because things will come and things will go and seasons will change, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. And these sacred words are as true now as they were when the ink was fresh on the paper and God is as faithful to his word now as he was when he spoke it through the prophets. He is faithful to his word and his word will never fail. And if there was ever a time we needed to know how to live by the word, it is now. And so Elijah says, God, I've done this at your word. I didn't just come up with this good idea. I've done this at your word. Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Watch what God does in verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. Please read the rest out loud and licked up the water that was in the trench. God said, I received the sacrifice of water that you have poured out. Twelve barrels. The Bible says God licked it up. He received the sacrifice. They that sow in tears, help me, shall reap in joy. So watch what happens in verse 41. Elijah said unto Ahab, who was the king, man, you better get up. You better eat and drink 
Do whatever you got to get done. Read the rest. For there is a sound of abundance of rain. You know, when it's getting ready to rain, you got to bring in what needs to be brought in. You got to pull in whatever needs to be pulled in. I remember being a little boy at my mama's house, and she'd say, son, go outside and get the, get the sheets and the towels and the linens off the clothesline. I grew up, and in the backyard, we had a clothesline because that's where mama hung the clothes so she wouldn't have to heat the house up with the dryer, especially in the summer months. And there ain't nothing like some sheets that have been bleached by the sun, glory to God. And so, Mama would say, son, it's about to rain. Go out there and help me get the clothes in. God here is sending rain, and Elijah knows it. So he tells Ahab, do what you got to do, man, but you better get back to your house. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. What makes him think it's getting ready to rain? I'll tell you what makes him think this. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. When you sow in faith, no matter what that seed is, you better know it's going to come back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's what Jesus said in Luke 6, 38. And he wasn't talking about just one thing. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus said, if you give Goodness, love, mercy, you're going to get that back to you. If you give judgment and condemnation, you're going to get that coming back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If you don't want it in your life, don't sow it in somebody else's. That's a word. If you don't want it in your life, don't sow it in somebody else's because it's going to come back in the same measure you meet. Well... Elijah recognizes what he just sowed. And he said, this is going to end this drought. This is going to end this drought. How do you end a drought of hate with love? How do you end a drought of fear with faith? How do you end the drought of deception with truth? Hey, glory to God. The body of Christ has got to rise up and start sowing the right seed so we can put an end to the drought. He said, Ahab, you better get back home, home man. man. Do what you got to do. Because I hear rain. And so he goes out in verse 42 and fell down on his face, put his face between his knees. He's unspoke all this in faith. He's done all this in faith. And he tells his servant in verse 43, he said, man, I can't even look. Would you go out and tell me what you see? And he went out to look over the sea to see if he saw anything. And I've stood over and looked across the Mediterranean Sea, and man, what a sight. And then you can see something coming from many, many miles away. And he came back and he said, man, I don't see nothing. Now, there ain't nothing worse than you done sowed, prayed, cried, and, 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 and you look for the harvest, and there ain't nothing. Look, 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 look what happened here. He, 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 look in verse 43. And he went up and looked and said, read it, there is nothing. Man, you, you, you went out looking for a job, and there was nothing. You went to the mailbox and there wasn't nothing. You checked your voicemail, it wasn't nothing. You checked your email, it wasn't nothing. It's tough when it ain't nothing. But once you've sown your seed, don't be moved by nothing because there's always something. You may not be able to see it, but that don't mean it ain't coming. Glory to God. So he told that sermon, he said, man, you better go look again. Look again, look again, look again. He did it seven times. And on the seventh time, verse 44, so you can't give up on your seed. Don't give up on your seed. Don't give up on your seed. Your seed is your future. That's why it's so important when your life is hard that you sow because sowing is always about the future. And, and, and he said, man, I know it's coming. Go look again. And he went and looked at seven times and he said, you know what? I see a little cloud. I see a little cloud, a little cloud. It's only little because it's far away. Wait till he gets here. Hallelujah. He said, I see a little cloud. Elijah ain't moved by that. He said, I just look because it's at a distance, but it's coming this way. It might look little now, but you ain't seen the full manifestation. Glory to God. Oh, my goodness, I need this word. Whoa. He said, go up, Ahab. You better get your chair connected to your horses. And if you know you're the king, you got the fastest horses and got the cleanest chair. You know he has some rams on that chair right there. He said, go up, prepare your chariot, 
and get thee down that the rain stopped thee not. I don't know if his chariot was enclosed. I don't know if it had a canopy. But all I know, he said, man, you better get your horses and get home. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain. And Ahab rode. Can you see him on his horses? Get up. Can you see him cracking the whip? You know the king had to fast his horses. You know he had to clean his chariot. And he riding on home. Man, hurry up, horse. Get me home. Get me home. Now watch this. He might have been on a horse, but the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. Ahab was on a horse. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah. Verse 46, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he girded up his loins. That means he kind of got his pants ready. And he ran. Ran like an Olympic sprinter. Ran like a cheetah. Ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. That means when Ahab got there, uh, Elijah leaning up against the city, the city gate, holding an umbrella. Man, where you been? I told you to get home. Rain just drenching. What led to that abundance? He sowed in a drought. He sowed in a drought. Church, if we're going to have the abundance of rain, we got to sow in a drought. I know right now it, it may, you may feel like your well is dried up, that your well is dried up. Jesus said in John uh, uh, 8, 37 and, and 38, he, 7, 37 and 38, that, 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 that out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. I want you to know no matter how dry it may look in this world or how, my, how dry it may look in the surface, greater is he that is in you. You got to know that the Holy Spirit, the Bible says when the enemy comes in, the Holy Spirit like a flood, like a flood, like a flood will lift up a standard against him. There is a source that's greater than this world. There is a source that is greater than any political promise. There is a source that is greater than any man could ever offer or commit to. And that source is our almighty God. And to know that he is able to sustain me. He's able to, to, to cause my deserts to become gardens in my home and my marriage, in my life, in my finances. He's able, but you are never going to see that harvest, that, that, that dream becoming a reality until we're able to sow when it is hard. Now, I want you to think just for a minute. I want to pray, and I want you to think and pray with me. Pray along with me, and, and this is what I would encourage you to pray. Father, how do I apply this to my life? How do I apply this to my life? What areas do I need to be sowing? Let's pray, every head bow. Father, we thank you today for your word. And Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would show us right now, Lord, our dry place. Is it our marriage? Is it our home? Is it our attitudes? Is it our finances? Is it our walk with you? Father, show us what's dry. What wells have been filled with dirt. We ask you for new wells today. Fresh water. A quenching of thirst. Turn our graves into gardens. Turn our graves into gardens. Turn our graves into gardens, Lord. That even when we're out in this world and in the presence of strangers, that we can demonstrate your love and your joy and your peace. May it invade our homes. God, if we as parents have gotten short-tempered with our children, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. May we be patient and kind. If our tones have been rough with each other, forgive us, Lord. Give us grace. We're all in this same fight together, Lord. Help us to sow in the drought seeds that will lead to life and refreshing. If we've neglected you and your word and your worship, forgive us, Lord. Cause that well that once gave us life to spring up again. In Jesus' name. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
I acknowledge my dry places. And the effect I've allowed them to have on me. And I ask forgiveness for any bad seed that I have sown. All acts of selfishness, sin, I ask forgiveness. And if I've lived my life off someone else's water, off someone else's well, lead me to dig new ones. That my life would lead others to you. I ask that your Holy Spirit would flow in me and through me to change this world around me. Help me to sow in drought what this world needs. And I thank you for the harvest that you'll bring on my life the hundredfold the optimum return that my life would be a garden that it be life giving and bring you glory I believe Jesus died for me for my sin my selfishness my past I believe you raised him from the dead so I could have new life eternal life So I ask that you would fill me with the gift of your spirit, that I would walk in your spirit, that my life would bring you glory in this season. In Jesus' name, amen.